The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you. There it is. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? We good on the, we good on the camera? Everything good to go? Excellent. I've been hacked, now what? Okay, hands in the air if you just don't care. Who's been hacked? Oh, I love honesty. For the camera that isn't panning around the room, that is everybody. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, hi, my name is Red. I've been a new Unix admin for 12 years, both sides of the pond. I used to build internet service providers for a living, so lots of experience of hackery there. Um, been blue team and incident response and forensics for five years, and I've been on red teams for a, an amount of time that I'm not allowed to disclose, um, a while. This talk is not aimed at security folk. Let me say this straight from the point. I know this is B-sides, but this is B-sides itself. Yes, sir? Can you explain what a blue team and a red team is? Certainly. Think. <laughs> OK. Blue team. So in the world of security, um, we have, they're not really competing teams. They are, um, they're complementary teams. What we do is we have a blue team which responds to security events such as break-ins and data leakage and stuff like that. And then we have a red team whose sole purpose in life is to make the blue team better. Uh, what a red teamer does is they go into a company or an organization and they say, how can I mess these people up? And then what we do is we then attack, destroy, and pillage the target organization um, all the while improving blue team. Um, the way that I like to think of red team is we're like a sparring partner for a box. We're just there to just keep punching him in the face. And so they're so used to, uh, the blue team is so used to being attacked and how to deal with that, that when they really, really, really get hit in the face, then they know how to deal with that and it's instinctual for them. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, Yes, they do. Try and mitigate the what? Yes, we do it without completely demolishing their system. We do steal their data, though, and give it to them a nice, pretty box and put it on the table. And there you go. And they appreciate it. So this talk is not aimed at security folk. Um, I've aimed this talk specifically <laughs> Um, at the uh, Southeast Linux Fest users. Uh, users, admins, sysadmins, boff H's, however you wish to describe yourself. This is how your average sysadmin reacts if he has no experience. <laughs> and it's not the security, it's not the sysadmin, it's not the guy who sets himself on fire, it's the business going, oh my god, the world is ending! And then they look at the poor sap in the corner who has root and says, fix it. And so what this talk really is about um, is in small to mid companies where there is no dedicated security team, I want to give you guys a fighting chance as to how to deal with a real legitimate attack. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So if you are the lucky one in the room and you have a security department, my best advice to you is to punt the incident of the security department as quickly as possible, drink beer, and eat popcorn and just watch the world collapse around them instead of you. It's, it's far more entertaining being on that side of the fence, um, especially when the C-level executives come in and start talking about losing millions of dollars. They get kind of serious. Mm -hmm. So there are six stages of incident response. The P-I-C-E-R-L model. <sighs> Excuse me. They are preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. This is very much like the seven-layer OSI model. It's technically correct, it's great theory, but when you're on fire, you don't to spend time choosing which brand of fire extinguisher to use. You just want to put out the damn fire. 
The PICERL model is great if you're in a large department and you have to worry about regulations, law enforcement, evidence gathering, and all of that. But if you're a small business or a mid-sized business and you've been popped, you just need to get the job done. <laughs> I am not your lawyer. In fact, I'm not a lawyer at all. Um, I know like cyber laws because cyber laws means I need to remember things like certain states require you to do reporting if certain states citizens or residents, uh, private information is released and each state has different laws and all of that and there is a legal department for that. I want nothing to do with it. I am not your compliance. I don't do checklists. Compliance has value in an organization. Um, it's not what I do and it, it's not what we're going to talk about today. And I'm not your boss, and that's, pri that's primary because how an organization chooses to respond to a, a hack is actually up to the business and not to us, not the admins, not the security team. We all bow down to the business because that's what we're here. We're here to make money. So you need answers to these questions before you're on fire. Um, and I'm going to give you some questions that you need to ask your business before bad things happen. And if bad things happen, you should probably ask them again because they'll probably deny all knowledge of answering uh, the previous questions when it doesn't work out how they want it to. So ask this question now. What is the most important thing to you, confidentiality, integrity, or availability? That is entirely dependent on what your business is and what type of data you're talking about. If a bank had to choose between the integrity of its database, meaning where the money lives, or the amount of money in everyone's bank accounts being leaked, which are they going to choose? Both are nightmare scenarios. Which are they going to choose? If you're talking about a trading floor where you have trades which are active, and if you're unable to trade, you could be losing millions of dollars a minute, then availability is going to be more important than confidentiality, because after all, what you trade is public anyway, right? So these are the questions that you need to ask before bad things happen. And all decisions you make during an attack are going to be influenced by these questions because you are going to have to compromise. It's the C word. You are going to have to compromise. So this, how important is attribution? versus availability. If somebody steals data from your company, how important is it to you to catch them? Is it important enough to have your, let's say, um, your, um, your e-commerce down for 12 hours? Is it worth that much to you? How important is it to do that? because you've got this whole trail of evidence and evidence collection, and it slows the entire process down. And under what conditions, if any, do you call law enforcement? If somebody steals $1,000 from you, eh, it's a business expense. If somebody steals $100 million from you, you might get a little more snarky, just a little, just a touch. But the moment that you call law enforcement in, you lose all control. Because law enforcement wants their prosecution. They want a straight line of evidence, and they want it easy. So they will walk into your data center, they will pick the machines up, and they will leave. And you will have no service. So these are the questions that you need to think of in advance before you're on fire. You have to think of these questions. They suck because they're hypothetical, but they become real very, very quickly. So if you're lucky and your environment runs on virtual machines, you get a get out of jail free card. Because virtual machines have this wonderful thing called a snapshot. So you need to do evidence collection, you need to do a snapshot, forensics, and all that other good, snap, all that good stuff. You just press snapshot, and you're done. There is your evidence. There's the evidence you can give to law enforcement. There's the evidence you can give to your lawyers. There's the evidence you can give to counsel. It's all there. You have a pristine image for all of that stuff. And most importantly for me, training. When new people come on, you need to be able to make sure that they can do this. What is better for them 
than to give them a real live event you had and said, you work out what happened. If you don't have a VM, then you have to bring the machines down and you need to DD off the entire disk image. Uh, DD is a, a Unix command for copying block devices. And when you're dealing with six hours of downtime because you're, top, you're, because you're copying you know, large amounts of data, maybe even terabytes of data, and you know, you're backing them up across the network, maybe gigabit, or you, know, you may be backing them off of fiber if you're lucky enough to have fiber channels on the machine. After six hours of downtime, you get calls from the executive saying, wind it up yet, wind it up yet, wind it up yet. Because I hate to say it, and I love, love business, but when someone hacks into a machine and you as security say, yeah, I need to take that down for six hours to do a backup, they don't hear the hacker cost me six hours of availability. They hear the security department cost me six hours of availability. And if you guys remember back, if you guys remember back from uh, the talk previously, IT is all about availability. And now I'm costing you six hours. You know, security is costing you six hours just because somebody broke into our website. Try and think of these things in advance because they will save a lot of flapping in decisions uh, when the time comes later. So <laughs> step minus one. Preparation. So you need one of these. Anyone familiar with the Type 40? Excellent. You need to go back to 1.30 this afternoon, and you need to attend a talk called Doug Burke's Talk Security Onion, peeling back the layers of your network in minutes. Hands up, anyone who saw it. Yes. Wasn't it a beautiful thing? It was standing room only, and it was standing room only for a reason, because you need data. And as far as bang per buck is concerned, Security Onion is off the scale. The reason you need third-party independent data from Security Onion is because your machines are going to lie to you because of rootkits, malware, and all that other good stuff. But, so back to preparation. This is and should be a talk unto itself, so I'm just going to just touch the high points. Hardening standards, love them and hug them. You can find them online. You Google hardening standards. It's, it's a very technical job being a security consultant. Um, to be quite brutal, 90% of the hardening standards rarely, will actually have an effect. It's the 10% that really does most of the work. Um, Subscribe to every security announced main list of the software that you deploy externally. Some people would say internally too, but focus, focus it outside. There's only so much you can do to protect the inside when you've got Java inside too. Sorry. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and force feed your developers OWASP content. OWASP. Um, OWASP is a wonderful organization. And what they do is they provide um, knowledge and experience um, surrounding web applications and security of web applications. Uh, if you run anything on port 80 or 443, you owe it to yourself to look these people up um, because they will, quite frankly, save your life at some point. And lastly, yes, sir? I just wanted to say we have a chapter here in Charlotte. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 you know what, I'm going to do it right here. So, like I said, we have a Charlotte chapter, and, and this gentleman here is a great contact to speak to you about that. But um, it's huge. Um, web applications and breaking web applications um, is a joy to do for fun and profit. Um, unfortunately, it's usually our joy and profit, and it's usually your guys' misery and being on fire. So, in all seriousness, the, the, you know, the more information and, you know, they'll talk about secure coding practices and common programming, and they have uh, basically different types of attacks and how they can mitigate them, and there's a huge amount of resource available both on the parent website and available to you locally via this chapter. As well as free and open source tools on the uh, OWASP.org. 
Yes, they do. They have free and open tools on the OWASP website. I didn't hit you again. Did you have a slide? I didn't. Okay. But that's OK. Um, OK, so to add to this, um, instrumentation. The biggest thing you have to deal with when you're on fire is you need as much information as possible. And especially when the machine that you're dealing with has been compromised, your machine very well will lie to you. Um, it's actually fairly rare to get root-kitted Linux boxes, in my experience. Um, it's, fair, it's extremely common on Windows, but it's, sometimes it's a little hard for the little script kiddies <laughs> to, do the, uh, to do it on the Linux side. Um, all the tools are there. They just don't. But then again, the last machine that I dealt with, they were uploading Solaris exploits and Windows exploits to it and trying to get those to work. So, you know. So, um, and this is huge. Remove old software and services. If you don't use it anymore, take it down. Because if you don't use it anymore, you're not going to think about patching it. You will always have zero days. I spell it Z-E-R-O because I hate the term O day. Hate it with a passion. But there will always be zero days. There's always going to be a way that a bad guy can get into your systems which no one knows about. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, you will always have stupid users, and stupid users set stupid passwords, and they do stupid things like open up firewalls and all that other good stuff. You will always have people that do that. They'll put usernames and passwords in text files, and they'll drop them on Dropbox or on slideshare.net. <laughs> I love slideshare.net. <laughs> We're all doomed. Being hacked is the, is the new assumption now. It, it has to be. And like you saw when I asked earlier on who's been hacked, every hand here went up. It's happening. It's done. We're done. So, but we're not completely doomed. What we have to do is retool ourselves and not look at how do we stop being hacked, because that just isn't going to happen. What we do is we work better on our detection. So we need to work out how to detect hostile activity at our perimeter. And perimeter doesn't necessarily just mean stuff that's outside the firewall and in the DMZ. That also means the humans at call centers. That also means the um, you know, dial, press 1 for this, press 2 for that, please enter your four-digit pin. Yeah, all of that. Anything which has contact is your perimeter. How do we detect and prevent lateral movement? Once someone has got a foothold in your organization, how do you detect when they go from host to host or server to server? How do you detect when credentials stolen from one machine are illegitimately being used to access another machine? You know, I see a, you know, if I'm on a machine and I see a list of you know, different sysadmins logging in from different, you know, from different machines, how do I know if they're real? There are ways. And then how do we show them the door in the least polite way possible, which is my favorite bit. So how do we basically cut the head off before they realize that we're watching them? Because there are times when you are operating in a live instant response where both of you are logged onto the machine at the same time. And you'll be like, that's nice. OK, he's connected in from Sweden. That's inconvenient. Um, OK, it's going to take me 20 minutes to call those people and drop that. OK, I'm just going to null root him from the host. Then he comes in from Jamaica. OK, I'm just, and then it just gets pointless. So. Step one in preparation, um, operating system instrumentation. Simple little things that will make your life infinitely easier. Anyone know what that does? That's exactly what it does. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So it shows you a date and time and the commands that you actually execute in your, in your history file. It's the tiniest little thing. But when you've, when you've worked on breach machine after breach machine after breach machine, and you're going through dot .bash history files, and all you do is you have a list of commands, you have no idea if it was today, yesterday, six weeks ago, or if the history file you're looking at is 12 months ago. Tiny little thing makes life so much easier. Uh, Unix process accounting. Um, probably going way back in the day, back when Unix was back when you charged Unix on the basis of time slices and all that other good stuff, um, they actually put together a really great tool, which is Unix process accounting, which was designed to do billing. But as a side effect of billing, it gave you every single command that was executed by shell by every user and on every TTY. TTY meaning every session. 
That's huge. How do you turn it on? Etc. init.d, AP, um, ACCT, start. That's it. You now have logs of every command that's executed in a shell. And if they're running a shell script, it'll actually show you every command in that shell script that is executed. So if it's modified, you see the modification. It's a beautiful thing. Um, audit what logs did you want to audit and send them to syslog and get them off the box. Huge. Because the first thing I'm going to do, sorry, the first thing an attacker is going to do um, when they get on a box and log in, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to open up your log files with VI and they're going to start deleting all their entries because they don't want you to know they're there. So get it off the box. That means now I have to get to that box. So you have just raised the bar significantly for an attacker to not get caught just by adding at IP address to your syslog server, sorry, to your syslogd.conf. That's it. And uh, with SSH, this is now mostly default over the last year or so, but just in case it isn't and you have some old systems, um, use DNS no, because SSHD would actually log the reverse address, not the IP address. And in many cases, um, when coming from hostile um, locations, the um, reverse addresses were hostile in nature. And crack your shadow files regularly, and I encourage you to do this to all your users. You, you break someone's password, they buy beer. That's a simple rule. Um, because if you can break the passwords here, they can be utilized anywhere else in your environment. And that is what lateral movement is all about. It's all about making it difficult for a person to get from point A to point B, so having easy to break passwords, nah, that, that needs to go, that needs to stop. So, Apache logs. How many here know what every single query in their web application is meant to look like? Yeah, that's me too. So, <laughs> you need to choose your log verbosity wisely. Uh, you need to balance security against the logging of confidential data. You can turn up um, logging verbosity on Apache significantly. Uh, Mod log forensic will do it for you. And it may make sense in your environment. I use the word may because, if it, because it will do things like log post requests, which means that if you're passing data such as, say, credit card numbers, that is now going to appear in your Apache log. Now, compliance guy freaks out about this. So, if you're dealing with stuff that is really that sensitive, this doesn't make sense. Um, there's a better way, and you require the TARDIS. Um, what you do is you log all your SSL traffic with Security Onion, for example, and then you can use Wireshark to tools to decode it. If you own the web server, you own the certs. If you own the certs, you own the private key. If you own the private key, you can decrypt all your SSL traffic. That's great, because what you have now is you have Security Onion logging all of this traffic in a completely encrypted form, which you know the auditors will be fine with because it's encrypted. Uh, <laughs> so you're logging all of this traffic, and then you, can, then you only refer to it if you need it. Just cycle it every 30 days or whatever. You know? And it's there. You ever get a break in, you could get your sessions from this traffic. You can go, oh, OK, so I saw a time change on this file at this time. It represents this item in the log file. OK, so it's this part of the PCAP. It's this session. And now I can look at both what was sent and what my server returned. Huge. You need to know what data is returned, but we'll come to that. So database logging. Uh, balance log verbosity against performance. And by balance log verbosity against performance, I mean buy a bigger database server. <sighs> I'm sorry, you, you need to be doing database logging. You need to be doing database query logging. You have to. You have to because it's the only way to answer the question, did they get or did they modify any data? That's vital. That's huge. That is the first question your legal counsel is going to ask you. The first question that they need to answer with confidence so they know whether or not to do reporting to regulatory bodies or states. 
because if they get it wrong, they go to jail. Not you, they go to jail, which is how it should be. But they go to jail. But it's important that we have to be able to answer these questions, so turn this logging on, please. Um, okay, step zero, abnormalities. I'm a great believer that there is no one who knows their systems better than the people that run them, period. I would say the vast majority of instances that, that I have worked have been from sysadmins or DBAs calling me and saying, this doesn't look right. Pay attention to that. Trust your gut. This is huge. I don't care how much security software, I don't care how many millions of dollars you've got invested in SAMs and IDSs and firewalls and all of that. All it's going to take is one of your guys tilting his head to the side and going, that's weird. Seriously, trust these people. Trust yourself, especially. Um, also, set up a security at yourdomain.com. Uh, very, very frequently, we will get um, emails to this where we'll have security researchers will, will email us and say, hi, about your half a million dollar website, which you do millions of dollars of transactions on a week. I can own it. Here's the proof of concept. Thanks. Seriously. They'll just email you completely out of the blue. And you email them and say, thanks, appreciate the heads up. You know, don't be a, an apple about it. You know, go ahead and... <laughs> Go ahead and you know, do the right thing. Embrace both internal and external tips. In the companies I work for, my phone number is known. I take tips. Somebody rings me up and say, hey, somebody else in this part of the organization is doing X, Y, and D. Anonymous tip, thank you, we'll get it sorted. Have to, have to be open to these things. Don't get bogged down. Anyway, so, also, external recon. You need to understand uh, how the rest of the world sees you. You should be searching paste bins. Everyone know what a paste bin is? No? OK, so paste bin is, uh, pastebin.com is the most common, the most commonly known, and it is frequently used by security researchers of all ethical persuasion to post information about what they found and what they've broken into. Uh, you should be looking for your stuff on a regular basis because you will find your stuff before you find out any other way, that gives you a head start, a big head start. And this is all about time when it comes. Shodan, uh, or Shodan HQ it is, it's a vulnerability, uh, it's Google for vulnerabilities for want of a better description. You put your organization name in and it will go through all the networks that, you, that your organization owns. It'll tell you what they are, what ports are listening, if any of them are vulnerable. It's, it's a little scary. And use Google Dorks against your domains. Big, huge fun. Um, when you have 150,000 users, um, this is a job in itself. It really is. Um, but if you're in a small to mid-sized company, again, this kind of thing will give you a head start. It's also really, really good um, customer service because you will have, let's say, Jenny in accounting who is on a cross-stitch website, and the cross-stitch website gets completely owned, um, and get all of the usernames and passwords get posted, and it has Jenny's e work email address, because she did it from work, and a password. Place your bets that she's reusing that password the same in our organization. Okay, webmail. Jenny accounting, try the password, it works. It works a lot because humans are lazy. We're all lazy. We all do password reuse. I don't care who you are. Don't lie. <laughs> so this is, this is really the meat um, of what we're going to talk about today, and that is containment. It's about you're on fire. Now stop, drop, and roll. Containment, according to the dictionary, is the act or condition of containing. Did that help? It's, it's, it's like... <laughs> It's like you're trying to define yourself by saying that you're yourself. Or a policy of checking the expansion or influence of a hostile power or ideology as per the creation of strategic alliances to support client states. Or a structure or system designed to present the radioactive materials. None of these really apply to what we do, right? So containment means different things to different people. 
Uh, if you speak to a network engineer, uh, specifically um, the network engineers we have who do this on a day-to-day -day basis, they see, they see hostile traffic, and their job is to remediate it. OK. So they firewall it. Done. But the hostile traffic isn't going anymore. But there are so many unanswered questions. So many unanswered questions. But the biggest nail in the coffin is this. If you can buy 1,400 or 1,500 SOC servers for $30, for $30 I'm just going to come at you again and again and again and again and again. Firewalling is whack-a-mole, and you're going to lose. <laughs> wait till IPv6 comes, although it's already here. But wait till it's wider. Yeah, it's, it's done. It's game over. You will never be able to deal with this kind of stuff with firewalling. Never. Just don't even try. Uh, the business's definition of containment is when can I forget about this happening, and when can I get back to the business of making more money? That's what the business wants to do. The business doesn't care what we do. It just wants it all to go away. They want to get back to business. So this is the definition. Um, this is my definition, and it's the one I'd like you guys to consider. It's the already known and discovered attack surface has been understood, assessed, and mitigated. So OK, so the already known. OK, so we know bad things have happened here. And discovered, oh, that means more bad things are going to happen. Attack surface, we'll come back to that has been understood, OK, assessed, OK, and mitigated. All right, so attack surface. Attack surface is what is exposed to an attacker. Your attack surface could be an entire machine with no firewall, with certain numbers of ports listening. You could look at port 80 and say, what, app, what executable applications do I have running on port 80? Because each one of those has an attack surface, because each one of those has functions that can be called, database queries that could be made, and all it's going to take is one of those, and the whole thing falls. So it's all about discovering attack surface. It's going to suck. Moving on. So, Step one, is there anything valuable on this box? What does this box do? What does it contain? That's both from a business standpoint, as in how much money is it going to cost me to take this machine down? Or how much money is it going to cost the, the business if we no longer have confidence in the data and they have to throw it away and start again? What about if it's been manipulated? What if it's been manipulated? What if, for example, it's a bidding system? It's a bidding system for contracts. What if someone has modified the bids for their competitor? What if someone has modified the bids for the competitor and made it appear to come from the competitor, then rung up giving you the anonymous tips, and now you're in litigation with them? But that's just evil. <laughs> you need to know what's on the box, and you need to know where it fits. You need to know where this box fits in with the rest of your environment. Are there any, is there any segregation or firewalls or any controls uh, between this machine and another machine. More important to me, do you share the same root password across your boxes? Do you all log in using LDAP authentication or Kerberos or Active Directory or anything like that? Because if so, the password here is going to work the password there. Wow, your attack service just went, whoa! I love single sign-on. Auditors love it too, but I love it more. <laughs> Live instant response um, requires multiple data sources, again, due to rootkits. I already talked about that. You can't trust what the machines are telling you. And the beauty of Security Onion, not that I'm wanting to beat on this same drum, is that your sensor, which is sniffing the traffic on this network, which has been attacked, doesn't even have to have an IP address on this network. It's just listening. So they can't attack it to manipulate or destroy the data. There's no connection to it. There's no IP address. There's, no, you know, there's nothing there on that layer. But it's listening. So big, huge notes. Write everything down. You will generate a lot of data. Um, oh, I'm pacing. Shouldn't do that. The biggest thing about this is when you start going through logs and all of this stuff, you are going to generate tens, 20, 
30, on your first pass, 10 or 20 or 30 interesting things. And each one of those is going to trigger off a different search to look for those other interesting things. Each of those searches takes time. You have to write it down. You want, and you want to write it down as soon as possible. It's like the, it's the proverbial rabbit hole. You don't want to realize you're three quarters of the way down the rabbit hole when you're like, gee, an hour ago, I remember doing this. So keep good notes. Huge. So let's talk about the uh, external perimeter. Anyone here, everyone here familiar with Nmap? OK. So Nmap is a port scanner. Its job is specifically to look for ports that are open. Um, give me a sec, Nmap's still running on this PowerPoint presentation. Um, so it's going to, oh, there it goes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here's, the, resu so here's the, the sample results for this, for this Nmap query. And you'll see that it tells you that port 22 is open, port 80 is open, port 443 is open, 3306 is open. Um, and it says that 1984 is filtered. And there are 995 closed ports. Now, there is a difference between a closed port and a filtered port. And it is vital for you to remember the difference. So you want to check on a Unix host whether a port is open or closed. Telnet, IP address or host name, port number, enter. If you get a connection refused, that is closed. If it hangs there forever, that is filtered. Big difference. If it is filtered, that means there is something actively, actively filtering that connection, which tells me that there is a firewall or network device in here, uh, which really doesn't like port 1984. It's probably some kind of political statement over the entire prism thing that broke out over the last few days. That'd be my guess. <laughs> so um, there are many other flags that you should be using. Um, SV. And dash P dash means do all 65,000. The one here up here, the first one that I did is the, first, is the top 1,000 ports and um, as quickly as possible. So do this first to give you your low-hanging fruit, and then do this to give you everything else. And you very well may find something there as well. And then UDP and such. File system enumeration. This is gold right here for you guys. Um, so on an inode on a Unix file system, there are three time slots. There is the create time, known as C time. There is the M time, known as modify time. And then there is A time, known as access time. C time is the time that the file was created. Stands to reason. Um, M time is the time that the file was last modified. So written to. And a time is the time that the file was last accessed. That could mean read. If you can take a list of every file on your machine, and you can say, give me them in the, in the order in which they were last modified, that's pretty cool. Because it means that if you end up with someone doing bad stuff, they tend to do that in 10, 15 minute chunks. So in this case, you can see that these files were modified, and these files were modified within about 20 minutes of each other. Do you see where I'm coming from? You now have a timeline of activity. Unix machines are actually really, 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 really good at not messing with lots of files. The vast, the vast majority of files on a Unix system are going to stay static. It's only typically log files and data files that move, or configuration files when they happen. This, this will save you, because it allows you to basically just snapshot and say, oh, there was an activity in this time. This is the time when that binary was written. OK, what other files were modified at that point in time? And you can just scroll through the list and find it. We should press the easy button. Because unless you work for a large company with something that's really worth stealing, the chances are this is how you got pwned. Um, if you have Telnet, SSH, FTP, MySQL, Orange, that should be Oracle, 
thank you, and Postgres. <laughs> It's, 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 it's code name for the new version of Oracle. Yeah. Mm. If you have any of those exposed, then people are hitting you 24 7, 365, and brute forcing your creds. And it can take any of those, we'll give them shell on your box. Because you can get shell from any of these databases, any of these database connections. You can read and write arbitrary files with these using SQL. PHP my admin. How many people have installed it? How many people uninstalled it after they finished setting it up? Good. The number of times I have, I have come upon compromised boxes and the guy who was setting up the box, God love him, somebody has to, didn't know how, um, how MySQL worked, so installed PHP my admin. Click, 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 click. I now have a database. I'm a DBA. Yay! Then they install their application. Yay! And then six years later, there are three or four exploits for my admin, and they never think to patch it. Why would they patch it? They don't use it. Tomcat Manager. In the configuration for Tomcat, it says it commented out. It's like, here's an example, username and password. How many people do you think, instead of entering a username and password, just go uncomment? Unbelievable. cPanel, Plesk. Again, along the same lines as PHP MyAdmin, you are providing front-end administrative access to your systems on pieces of software that need to be regularly patched and secured, which means setting passwords that are good, and so on and so forth. People don't do it. Slash admin in your applications or CMSs. I've come across places where it's like slash secret, because I'm never going to look there. <laughs> Secret hidden directory. No, we find it. And again, the more modules you install on these CMSs, the more, um, the more bugs you're going to find. I'm going to tell a story. The, uh, I'm the founder of Hackerspace Charlotte, and I'm proud to say that our website was hacked. Our website was hacked and compromised and rooted and shelled, and it was a beautiful thing. And the way they got in was the CMS that we used, one of the things we installed and downloaded was a thing that created thumbnails for images. It had a bug in it that allowed arbitrary shell execution. They were in. They put a web shell up and our machine was owned. We had to, um, it was one of the large hosting companies that I won't name but is blue in color. And they do hosting. And uh, <laughs> we couldn't get them to blow away the image, so we had to close the account and open another account and start again. Because, yeah, so. And old crusty hacks that you hide in obscure directories like slash secret, slash boff h, you know, the usual places, usual haunts. I will be the first to tell you that I have written code not hugely recently, but recently enough that I'm embarrassed that is vulnerable to a whole bunch of stuff. And it may still be running in a production environment. And you have to remember where you put this stuff. Anyway, Apache logs. There is a great little application called, uh, or utility called Apache Scalp. And what it does is it takes, um, it takes IDS, um, IDS, intrusion detection signatures, and it looks through your Apache logs for, um, for these strings. So if you're looking for something like SQL injection or command injection or remote file injection, and these are all ways that people can compromise your site. I'm not going to go into the details. But all these ways that people can do this, if it's in your log file as a get request, then this will find it for you. It may sound like a stupid thing, but when you're dealing with millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of lines of logs, the best thing you can do is you can grab minus V, which means remove 404. Because if it doesn't exist, it didn't matter. So get rid of it. And there goes 70% of your logs. Grab all the things. You have to. Grab. Swiss Army chainsaw of the shell 
will give you any information that thou dost require. Grep is your friend. You need to notate anything suspicious and log entries. Again, I encourage you, write it down on paper because it's so much easier to do this. Collate all suspicious files, log entries, database queries, network traffic, and place them in a timeline. So get them roughly in order. Check for unauthorized cron jobs. Happens a lot, um, especially when you're talking about people putting Linux machines on botnets. They will set up cron jobs that run every minute to make sure that their IRC bot is still running. And rinse and repeat. So just keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this, this same process over and over and over and over and over and over, and you'll be sick of it, and over until you have all of your loose end ties up. And there may end up being hundreds of things that you have looked at, and maybe only 12 or 13 things that you really care about. So like I said, there are two main ways to send data in HTTP. Um, get is what we were talking about a moment ago. And that's when your data actually ends up being appended to the URL. And then there's post. And post data is actually not sent as part of that, so isn't logged unless you have forensics on. And you need the onion to do that. So again, I cannot overestimate log your SSL traffic. The onion's awesome, by the way, if I mention that. This is also why you need the database query log. If you suspect the data has been exfiltrated, you can go to your database, and if someone has done SQL injection, you will see that nasty, horrible SQL query. The SQL query will be 15 pages long, and even your DBA of 25 years will look at it and go, I have no idea what that does. That is what you then look for in your logs, and, and, and you, go, you work backwards from there. If you can work from the database backwards, it's going to be so much faster for you. You've got a suspicious process. Um, is everyone familiar with LSOFL trace and S trace? I can do a quick demo if necessary. So Unix processes. OK, rule zero of Unix, because all rules and all programmers start at zero. Everything in Unix is a file. You want to access a camera, it's a file. You want to access an Ethernet device, it's a file. You want to access your hard drive, the hard drive block device is represented as a file. A piece of memory, which is in shared memory, is represented by a file. Everything in Unix is a file. It has what's called a file descriptor. What LSOF does is it shows you all the open file descriptors, all the open file handlers, which means you can look at a process and say, oh, it's listing on this port. It's connected to this host. It's writing to this log file. It's this, this. And it'll show you everything you need to know about a process. It's really cool. S-Trace, um, so LSOF gives you a snapshot. S-Trace will, you know, let me demo this. Let me show you. This is really cool. How am I doing for time? How many? 15? Eek. All right, come see me after if you want to see this stuff. It's really cool. Just happened. Come on. There we go. So what S-Trace and L-Trace allow you to do is actually look at the data and watch your process does while it runs. So that allows you to see what it's doing. Give you an example of when I use S-Trace in an incident. I was suspicious of the SSH process that was being used to log in. And I did an LSOF, and it didn't look weird. So I did a system call trace on it, and then I SSH'd into the box. I saw it open, open and write to a file as I logged in. It logged in, it wrote to a file which was user includes sysif.h. Didn't anyone tell me what an SSH process is doing writing to a header file? The answer is writing my credentials. <laughs> so when you actually looked at that header file and user includes sys, it contained the credentials for probably the last six or seven weeks of everyone that had logged into that box, which I then stole and used in a later pen test. But never mind. So <laughs> Ltrace also shows library calls. Um, by the way, trust is the equivalent on Solaris. 
L trace shows library calls. So if you're curious what your program does, you know, why is it including that weird library? Then you can actually look and it'll show you actually function by function what it calls. And again, remember, your operating system might lie. Why do I have that horrible Windows thing at the bottom? Ew. Yeah, I really am worrying. Sorry. You lied to me? 25 minutes? OK. But you are the last one on the so you can pretty much talk as long as everybody. Willing to sit here. None of you wanted to go party with MC Front a lot anyway, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, so again, you have to make it all make sense, and you have to have context. So all of the stuff that you found, the 13, 15, or 20 you know, artifacts you found that were particularly interesting, reference them against your file system timeline, your firewall logs, and security onion, and so on and so forth. Uh, at this point, you should have a pretty good idea of what they actually did. And that is vital, uh, because once you have an idea of what they did, you can have an idea of what it is they were trying to achieve. If all they were wanting to do was to insert JavaScript into your front page, like happened at CBS, was it CBS News? CBS News was, uh, was delivering malware to all of the people that were viewing their website. The people who broke into CBS, all they did was, sorry, CBS, the people who broke into CBS, all they did was, ins was install 20 odd characters into one of the pages. That's all they did, and then they left. And then they just deposited malware on every person who visited that site. And they did that for several days running because CBS found it, fixed it, a couple of days later, back again, fixed it, a couple of days later, back again, because they never found their problem. But we'll get to that. Um, don't chase perfection, because you're not going to chase perfection during um, the containment. Uh, that comes later. And all you need to do at this point is to get a strong confidence. You need a strong confidence as to what happened and why. Um, if somebody asks you the question when you're working live instant response, did they steal the data? Don't say no. Don't say, uh, say we have no evidence of that yet. You can't say no because you won't know until the more thorough investigation happens. And it's very difficult to undo a no and say, well, yes. It's a credibility thing. So you know, just say, we don't know yet. We do not have sufficient evidence. But like I said, we have a new machine. The attacker may have cracked all the passwords. We have a newly exposed attack surface. I now have the database passwords for your database because I looked in the configuration file for your application. On the database, can the credentials for that application, uh, was the DBA lazy and just made it SA or root? It happens a lot. Or did they actually put together a user which only had the ability to read and write to that, spe that specified partition part? These things matter. What password certificates and credentials are present? <laughs> Are there any hard-coded passwords in any shell scripts? You need to be looking for these things, all the while breaking etc. shadow and embarrassing your coworkers, because that's, that's required activity. So you have to inventory everything that they could have possibly gotten. And on the subject of certificates, if somebody breaks a box which has an SSL certificate, do the right thing and reset it. Don't do what one Linux vendor did when their RPM signing certificate was on a machine that got compromised. And they said, there is no evidence that they, took, that they even saw the certificate, let alone took it from the box, so we're not resetting it. Please don't do that. Please do the responsible thing and just change out the certificate. You're going to have to do it anyway, because they expire, right? What's 15 years early? It's going to be painful at some point. Don't punt it down to the next guy. Enjoy it. Relish it. Is this device one of a number of similar devices? Is it part of a cluster? You know, how many machines, let's be honest, how many single machines are there in environments nowadays? There's almost always two, even if it's just for DR. How are they configured? Do they have the same things? 
did the sysadmins install their private SSH keys in there because it was easier for them to do that, to copy files around, than to copy to their desktop and then back again, or their Bastion host? Check. Does this device have implicit trust to any other systems? Our hosts? Any of that? You need to, uh, once you've got a sense of what the people do and how they work and frankly how smart they are or are not, um, you can develop indicators of compromise specific to that attacker. So for in the example I gave earlier, an indicator of compromise would be that they replace the SSHD binary. I dealt with one attack where their indicator of compromise, God love them because somebody has to, was to replace the netstat binary with a shell script that said netstat, uh, which said, uh, P no, no, sorry, it replaced the PS binary with a binary that said PS, dollar star, which means whatever arguments you provided, pipe gret minus V and the name of his process. Because that's a rootkit. He just, just grepped out the processes he didn't want people to see. It was effective in the first line of defense, but we didn't fall for it. And tests for them everywhere. If you've got a very simple indicator of compromise, such as an MD5 sum of a, of a binary, then with three or four lines of shell script, you can just go, <laughs> do it. You've got a thousand machines, okay. You just run an MD5 on a thousand machines. You've now got peace of mind. And that peace of mind is priceless. Eradication in my last five minutes. Rebuild. That's it. Really. I mean, don't even try. Don't even try to fix it. I'm, I'm not kidding. Because once someone has root to your box, there is no way on earth you are going to find everything that they've done. It's just not possible. Rebuild. Have confidence that, you know, that's it. You can gain some confidence as to how much of the, t how much of the backups you can go to from the timeline that you generated, but over-exaggerate it and go back further. Um, but you really need to rebuild the box. I cannot overemphasize that. And you also need to check your database. Because especially in more modern applications, a lot of your configuration and, a and pretty much all of your access control and all that sits in the database. And the database in a, in a two or three tier system lives on a different host, which may not have been compromised, right? But you have to check those things too. But if you have that database query log that I was talking about earlier, you could look for changes. Grep update, grep insert. It makes your life so much easier if you have the information to hand. Otherwise, you're just guessing. Um, recovery. Once you've found the method of entry, um, test other systems in your environment. Look for it, because it's, if it's in one place, it's going to be elsewhere. And test anything new against the newly discovered vulnerabilities. I actually have a, che a cheat sheet of methods that people have used to break into places that I've worked. And we roll them into the testing we do. Because it's one thing, it's one thing to, be, to be owned by something that you haven't dealt with before. It is embarrassing and mortifying from a professional point of view to be pwned by something that you've dealt with before. And frankly, it's kind of inexcusable. Yes, sir? In some cases, yes. In a lot of cases, yes. I tend to do it in, I tend to do it in Perl, Perl or Shell. Um, also, when you're looking for things like, um, if you're looking for things like default creds on, um, sorry, if you're looking for things like software that shouldn't be there, um, then tools such as Durbuster and Nikto um, are very good for that. And what they will do is they will look for common applications such as that, and also a couple of rootkits, um, or sorry, web shells, and they will look for that stuff. And it's one of the first things we do when we hit a web, when we hit a pen test. You know, the company will say, well, here's, a, here's our application. Cool. I'm still going to run Nikto against it. I'm still going to run Durbuster because you will find developers that will do a slash private reports. And the data will be sitting there in plain text because no one's going to think of looking in slash private slash reports. It's 
Crazy. Oh, and lastly and most importantly, place all stolen passwords in your cracking dictionary for future profit. You, you have to do that. And I think... So after everything's died down and service is restored, that forensics image that you created, um, spend some time with it. Get to know it. Um, if there was a rootkit on the box, then offline analysis, i.e. analysis of the disk image as opposed to the running operating system, will show you a whole world of new files that you didn't see before. And you might find something in that that makes you go, oh no, that was three weeks earlier than when I thought. And then you have to go back and you have to do this. This is due diligence. And this is the point at which you can look at the business straight in the eye and say, your data's safe. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Anything? Yes, sir. Yes. So the question was, um, is, it po um, was, is it difficult to say with confidence that your data is safe or hasn't been taken? The answer to that is yes. And the way that the lawyers will ask you uh, when you're dealing with your legal counsel is they will say, do you have any evidence that the data has been removed from the environment? Or do you have, ev any, ev do you have any evidence that the data has been, has been you know, manipulated, observed? And it's a matter of, do you have evidence that? It's impossible to prove a no, much with everything in this world. So they will ask directly, do you have any, any evidence that shows that this may have happened? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And those people deserve to be on the street as having no ethics. Well, yeah. yeah. But yeah, and there, I mean, there is, and there's also going to be a skills issue too. I mean, not everyone, you know, is as good as forensics as some others. I mean, obviously in any industry, there's, there's varying levels of skill um, and thoroughness. But the other thing I'll say is when you're dealing with a high stakes thing, and you're in a group with multiple analysts, we will frequently not work with each other because I hate to say we all have our own, we all have our own methods and approaches and they're slightly different, which means that we will usually come, we'll come to the same answer but by two or three different routes. And when that happens, then it gives you a significantly higher confidence than someone saying, yeah, I found this and him going, yeah, that looks good. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. What's your opinion on, uh, I watched your other write-up about data security and protection services. The which, sorry? Uh, I watched your other I about data security and protection I am not familiar with it. Do you want to give me a brief synopsis? I was just watching, I know about services, any service on the system you subscribe to, like a file of change? Uh-huh. So, oh, so almost like Tripwire, like file integrity? I'm more of a Tripwire. Okay. Um, I like, so I have a love-hate relationship with those types of tools. The reason being that the business driver is almost always compliance because the regulations or PCI, for example, says you must have it, which means that it gets implemented but not necessarily implemented very well. And the big battle, the huge battle with file integrity monitoring is deciding which files to monitor and which ones not. And it's, uh, it's a balance between I'm drowning in changes versus I don't hear anything and it's completely pointless. So it's almost, it's almost kind of like IDS and IPS. Um, if you have intrusion detection systems and you have them turned on, sorry, if you have intrusion prevention systems and you have them turned on to block, they will affect your business. And the business doesn't care that you stop 20 or 30 people 
you know, in the last hour downloading malware, but the business will care the one time that someone couldn't click submit on a form for accounting. It's an, so tools like that are kind of no win for us um, in small companies um, and in companies where you're not having to deal with regulation and compliance. I'd be all over it because I'd be able to do it right. But in companies where the, in large companies, when the driver is really not security, then it can be more of a hindrance than a help. Does that make sense? And um, did you have a question? No. You kind of went over a little bit of ports being uh -huh. mm -hmm. for closed ports and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some imports for your service are going to be running. What's your opinion on either drop or deny? So there's a third option, which is respond to everything. I love that. As a defender, that's awesome, because as an attacker, the attacker is doing the exact opposite thing as a defender, right? What an attacker, you know, what an attacker does is it says, okay, here is a box. Now I'm going to enumerate all of the ways that I can get in. And if it does a port scan, and it, you know, honestly, the difference between filtered and closed means I wait 30 seconds versus I wait a minute. So it doesn't really affect me. However, if you respond to every single one of my SIN packets, I'm done. I have to do it by hand. And you could be talking, you could be talking hours for me to evaluate one machine. It is so effective, that method is so effective that when we engage businesses, we ask them to turn that off because, not because we can't get around it, because we can, but because they're paying us per hour so really all they're doing is wasting their money. Does that make sense? Because I mean, our job is to find the holes. And so the faster we can do that, the better value for money you're gonna get. So just, it's, all it does is flood us, is floods us with, is floods us with data. So, but that is by far the most effective defense, is respond to everything. Oh yeah, you sent me a sin? Here, have a sin act, please. I hate it. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, cool. Thank you very, very much for coming. And thank you for coming to B-Sides. Final words? Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? 
Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, 
and robust platforms out there. Add on seeing your limits with a cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.